All right, so we're gonna move on and we'll talk about those enhanced imaging as they've made their way into the guidelines too. All right, so first ARS question, based on the AUA SUO 2017 guidelines for non-muscle invasive disease, a repeat TUR would be indicated for, and your choices are T1 tumor, variant histology, high-grade TA, or all of the above. All right, looks like 75% picked all of the above, and we will discuss that. And I believe there's a second ARS question for this group. Um, <clears throat> based on the AUA SUO guidelines, BCG maintenance therapy is recommended for three years in patients with uh, CIS, TA, T1 low-grade, nested variant. Those are your choices. All right, looks like 73% picked CIS. Still a, a fair number picked uh, um, high-grade TA, so we'll talk about that in the risk stratification part. I always bring you a little bit from Oklahoma. So this is Will Rogers. Good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. I've certainly been guilty of that along the way. So the um, AUA guidelines for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, came out about a year ago. Um, they highlighted the things that we just introduced, risk of recurrence and risk of progression. Um, looking at the risk stratification to try and really help identify the right way to go with the treatment. So is isn't just a, a naming or a diagnostic tool, but actually is a way to um, stratify the treatment regimen that we do. Um, they start out pretty easy, but you'd think that this stuff would be that easy to get, but I can tell you we review a lot of operative reports and notes from across different uh, practices, and sometimes just basic things like the size of the tumor, location, whether it was multiple or not, papillary or sessile, um, other abnormal mucosal, did you perforate the bladder or did you think you didn't? Those are just basic things that are not in a standardized op note that would be nice if they were. So they do include some guide, guidance on that. Um, and then, you know, the goal, unless the tumor is so big that you can't completely resect it or the patient needs to be awakened because they're not tolerating the procedure, the goal should be complete tumor resection when feasible. Um, the studies that have been done on these enhanced technologies kind of, un uh, they reveal to us that we are really not able to completely resect all tumors all the time, even though our eyes may tell us that we're doing a pretty good job. At the time of original presentation, patients should undergo upper tract imaging, and that imaging is usually either retrogrades in an ultrasound or CT urogram. It's something that lights up the lining of the urothelium as well at the time of initial presentation. Surprising how few patients have that these days. Um, in a patient with a history of non-muscle invasive disease who has like a positive urinary cytology, but you, the bladder itself looks okay, they remind us to look for extravesical sites, upper tract, as I mentioned, prostatic urethra, um, and enhanced detection techniques may be valuable there too. So uh, at each time of occurrence or recurrence, the clinician should assign a staging and a risk strata low, intermediate, or high risk for those patients. The, before this guideline came out, most of what was out there for risk stratification was derived from some European and Spanish studies, many of those patients that had BCG too. So those are out there. There's little tools, even an EORTC risk calculator. So you can, they include the usual suspects, size, grade, stage, recurrence, pattern, and number. The AUA took it one step further. They added some additional risk strata, so lymphovascular invasion, prostatic urethral involvement, variant histology, and if they'd had a poor response to previous BCG. So this is the risk stratification table that they used. There are not that many low-risk patients, right? They're very, those are the small, low-grade, solitary TA tumors, and then the pun lumps, the neoplasia, the, the very low malignant potential neoplasia. The high-risk ones are high-grade T1, because there aren't very many low-grade T1s, um, recurrent high-grade TAs, large high-grade TAs, any CIS, BCG failed patients, variant histology, lymphovascular invasion, and prostatic urethral involvement. 
and we'll talk about the recommendations for the treatment based on the sorting of those into those categories. They highlighted the importance of recognizing variant histology. So all of us use different pathologists. Some are really good and have expertise. Some of them may not. So if you get a variant histology, if you start hearing the words like plasmacytoid, nested variant, micropapillary, those are buzzwords that would you'd want to get a better opinion on it if you're not comfortable with it because many times that will change the therapy simply based on getting that right at the start. Um, if you're considering any kind of bladder sparing and you have a variant histology, you better go back and re-resect those patients. And there are just too many patients that are already muscle invasive, for example, in those nested variants, et cetera, et cetera. They did discuss urinary markers, but they state clearly that they have not replaced cystoscopy um, for evaluation as we sit here today. So they listed the markers. They say it's hard to compare them directly because the way the studies are done, but it, we can't just omit office cystoscopy as the follow-up based on urinary markers. Where they did see value in those markers was in patients that are sort of needing an arbitrator. So if you're having an atypical cytology and you're not sure what that means, if you've had um, assessing response to, for example, BCG therapy with the fish, as I outlined in my first talk, there is value there. For low-risk patients, at least based on the markers that they evaluated at the time, they didn't feel like any of them were really performing well enough to use them um, in, for routine more for the higher risk patients. The value of a repeat TUR, so this was mentioned in the, in the pre-question. Um, patients that you can't completely resect, they need to go back and re-resect them. The medicine's not gonna make the tumors disappear in most cases. Um, for high grade TA tumors, it was you know, strongly recommended to go back. And for T1 tumors, unless you're gonna remove their bladder based on that, you need to go back. So, those were all part of it. This is one study that was done a few years ago looking at T1 tumors and the value of that re-resection, and the patients who underwent a repeat resection had lower rates of recurrence and also had less progression of their disease. So it can be both diagnostic to uncover a more invasive tumor in the T1, and it also can be a value for you know, figuring out who is now completely resected so they can go on to benefit from the therapy. So these are listed here. I think we had a multiple choice, but um, incompletely resected, high-grade TA, T1, and variant histologies are all very reasonable for that four to six weeks, go back and, and repeat the resection. They included a section on single-shot intravesical therapy. That's for the low-grade or the intermediate risk patients. These are not people that you're predictably you know they're gonna need BCG, you know they're gonna need some sort of um, induction chemotherapy. But for those little tiny tumors, when there's no perforation, certainly there has been some level one evidence to suggest that a single installation of mitomycin can reduce the risk of recurrence over the next 12 to 24 months. For induction therapy, for the truly low risk patient, that small TA tumor, or the low malignant potential tumor, they don't need intravesical therapy. They simply need to be followed. For patients that are intermediate risk, though, those patients can either have chemotherapy, six weeks, or BCG for six weeks. And then for those high-risk patients, which we went over in the menu, those patients should undergo BCG therapy for six weeks based on the superiority over intravesical chemo. And then when you're an intermediate risk patient and you've responded to that first six week course, then you can consider maintenance. If it was chemotherapy, maintenance chemo. If it was BCG, maintenance BCG. But they cut off the BCG at one year for the intermediate risk group based on trials that we'll show a little bit later. And for the high risk patients, they're recommended to do longer duration of maintenance and some data suggests up to three years of maybe a benefit. What about the BCG failed patients? Well, we just talked about that, so I don't think we really have to duplicate our efforts here, but they do include management of BCG unresponsive and salvage treatments for these patients. So if you are failing after a single six-week course, you can go on, especially for the TA tumors, to get maintenance or a second six-week course. 
If you have a T1 tumor, though, and you have another T1 right after that six week, it's kind of a special circumstance, and you certainly have the uh, benefit of knowing that there's data to remove bladders in that setting, and radical cystectomy should be discussed with the patient before you proceed with your next step. And then this talks about um, those patients that meet the definition of failure. So if you've had two six-week courses or six weeks in maintenance and you're still recurring, then you're by definition unresponsive and you may be offered a switch to a cystectomy or a clinical trial as my first talk outlined. They also bring up the cystectomy. If you remember when we first started talking, I said up to a third of patients with high-risk non-muscle invasive disease will undergo a cystectomy. So it's, it's permeated throughout the guidelines that that those patients may need that. It's not recommended for those low-grade, low-stage ones, but it is recommended for the high-grade, recurrent, and T1 tumors, and certainly those mixed-variant histologies that we talked about. Enhanced cystoscopy made it to the guidelines, so that was the first time, and it includes both the CISVIEW and the blue light, and includes the narrowband imaging. Um, notice the strength of evidence, as I told you, is better for the enhanced uh, cis view and the uh, photodynamics as opposed to the narrow band, but both are mentioned in there as ways to both improve on the enhanced detection and decrease recurrence. So uh, we already talked a little bit about the narrow band. It takes advantage of the wavelengths in which uh, blood vessels absorb light, looking at the blue-green spectrum. And the easiest way, I think, is to think about you know, being in the ocean and the water, the background is green, and the tumors are the little brown people floating on top, and that's exactly how it works, and that's how it looks. The data I showed you earlier has benefited from, you know, a, an enhanced detection, uh, which has then uh, resulted, in, at least in some series, in a reduction in recurrences because you did a better job the first time around. The blue light we also talked about in my first talk, so we'll just say that they're in the guidelines. The enhanced detection is available through the FDA. There is also on the move um, right before the FDA currently uh, flexible blue light in the office. So that was a clinical trial that was presented at the AUA last year and is now moving forward. But this is currently operative room type recommendation. Uh, it does require special Carl Stortz proprietary setup and then the medicine has to be placed in the bladder usually 45 minutes to an hour before the TUR, and then the photoporphyrin is selectively uptaked in 10 times greater than normal tissue, so it allows you in many cases to see better. This is just some different trials that I, I will highlight that show that it was enhanced detection of, of um, the TA as well as the T1 tumors, which then uh, resulted in a reduced recurrence, and that's been shown in the U.S. Pivotal trial that's shown here. So it's about a 20, 16 to 20 percent, depends on um, which uh, type of tumor you're looking at and which uh, study you look at. The guidelines also presented data on follow-up, which we all are aware of, but um, it was noted that we probably are overdoing it with the low-risk patients. So for low-risk patients, those little TA tumors, usually a look at somewhere in that three months range, if it's negative, probably don't need one for nine months after that. So basically could get by with two cystoscopies for the year. That's different than the patients that have um, the higher grade tumor. They also acknowledge that office fulguration is a reasonable option for these low grade, low stage tumors. Not everybody needs um, to go to the operating room. And then for them, they really don't require a lot of vigilant upper tract for the truly low grade, low stage ones. That's different than intermediate and high risk. They do recommend every year or two some sort of upper tract imaging. So that should be probably part of your algorithm, as well as uh, every three month cystoscopies, at least for the first two years, and then six months in the three, four, or five years until you get out about five years, where they still need at least annual cystoscopies. So I think that's the end of the non-muscle invasive guidelines. So the take-home points there, we've talked about risk stratification, value of taking back and doing a repeat TUR for those special circumstances listed, judicious use of technology where it's available to you, maintenance therapy with the intermediate for one year, 
and three years for the higher risk patients and identification of BCG failed patients early so you can move on to additional therapy, clinical trials, or cystectomy.